Up to this point, we've been dealing with algebraic equations. Algebraic equations help us describe the value of one quantity in the system as a function of the value of another quantity in the system. But in science, we're often interested in studying how things change or evolve. Calculus is the mathematics of how a quantity is changing. Derivatives describe the rate of change of a quantity's value and is equivalent to the slope of a plot of that quantity. Integrals are the inverse of derivatives in that they describe the accumulation, or sometimes the depletion, of a quantity due to its rate, and is equivalent to the area under the curve of a plot of that rate. Let's take a look at derivatives first. Consider the artificial data shown for tumor volume versus time. In this plot, we have time on the horizontal axis and the tumor volume, which we've labeled f, which is a function of time, on the y-axis. The average rate of change in the tumor volume between years 0 and 6 can be found as the change in the volume from the endpoint to the starting point divided by the duration of that observation. In this case, we're taking the difference in the volume at time 6 and the volume at time 0 and dividing that by the difference in time from the start to the end of the observation, in this case, six years. The change along the vertical axis of a plot is often referred to as the rise, while the change along the horizontal axis of a plot is often referred to as the run. The average rate, as described by this equation, is equal to the slope of the associated triangle of this plot, where the triangle consists of the run, the change in the horizontal axis on one side of the triangle, the rise, or the change along the vertical axis on the other side of the triangle, and the slope being equal to the rise over the run. But as you can see, the average rate, which is the slope of this large right triangle, may not accurately reflect the true rate at every instant, as drawn here in this orange curve. In this case, the average slope overestimates the true slope at both the early times and the late times, where you can see the purple hypotenuse has a much higher slope than the local slopes shown in this dashed green line. At the same time, we see that the average slope in this plot underestimates the local true slope in the intermediate years. So if we wish to determine the true rate of change at year three more accurately, what we're going to need to do is we're going to calculate the average rate over a shorter period of time. Rather than looking from year zero all the way to year six, we'll take a shorter interval of time around year three. For instance, we can look just between years two and four and evaluate the tumor volume at year four and year two. And again, using rise over run to calculate the slope, we can get the average slope or the average rate of change of the tumor volume between years two and four. Calculating the average rate over a shorter period of time provides a more accurate estimation of the true instantaneous rate for any instant in that time window. And as you can see, this shortened time window gives us a better approximation of the true slope at the three-year time point. In the limit that we shorten the time window to be infinitesimally small, we can obtain an exact determination of the instantaneous rate at that point in time. Mathematically, we say that the average rate is the difference between the function over a time window divided by the duration of that time window, or more concisely, delta f over delta t. We then take the limit as delta t approaches zero to get an infinitesimally small time window. In this limit, the difference ratio on the left becomes a derivative of f with respect to t, as shown on the right. And that derivative is equal to the instantaneous rate of this function at this particular time point. If the data can be fit with a mathematical function, say f of t, then the instantaneous rate of change can be found by taking the derivative of that function df dt. Now, in the case we just discussed, the quantity of interest varies as a function of time. That was the tumor volume growing. 
but we may also be interested in quantities that vary as a function of position, which would be written as f of x. For example, f of y could represent the variation of the salt concentration in seawater as a function of depth in the ocean. In that case, the rate of change of salt concentration with depth would be found by taking the derivative of that function with respect to y. So far, we've talked about quantities that vary only as a function of one variable, either as a function of time or as a function of space. A quantity that varies with both time and space simultaneously will require evaluation with partial derivatives rather than total derivatives. The use of partial derivatives is beyond the scope of this tutorial and unlikely to appear in the Physics 1 series. Let's look at the derivatives of some common math functions. If f of x is cx, where c is just some constant value, then the derivative df dx is just that constant value. If the function is cx squared, we find the derivative by bringing the exponent down and then reducing that exponent by 1. This gives us the derivative of cx squared to be 2cx. If the function f of x is equal to c over x, we can rewrite this as c times x to the minus 1, remembering that x to the negative power is the same as 1 over x to the positive power. We can then repeat the procedure of bringing the exponent down and reducing the exponent by 1, which then results in the derivative of c over x as being minus c over x squared. Generalizing this process, for a function cx to the n, where n is any number, we simply bring that number down and reduce that exponential number by 1 to give us that the derivative of cx to the n is n times cx to the n minus 1. If f of x is just a constant, we remember that x to the 0 is the same as 1. And we can always multiply any number by 1, so we can write c as cx to the 0. We repeat the procedure of bringing the exponent down. Then we end up with a 0 out front, and 0 times any number is 0. And that tells us that the derivative of a constant is always 0. Finally, we can go back and use a similar trick. And whereas x to the 0 is 1, x to the 1 is x. Finally, we can go back and evaluate the derivative of cx using a similar trick. Whereas x to the 0 is 1, x to the power of 1 is just x, which means that we can purposely rewrite x as x to the 1, and then repeat the procedure of bringing the exponent down and reducing that exponent by 1. But x to the 0 is 1. So we can get rid of both that 1 and that 1, and we're just left with c. Some other derivatives of common functions include the derivative of the exponential e to the x. Turns out that the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. Similarly, the derivative of a constant times e to the x is just that same constant times e to the x. On the other hand, if our function is c e to the kx, where k is yet another constant, then calculating the derivative involves bringing down that k while leaving the rest of the expression unchanged. So the derivative of c e to the kx becomes k c e to the kx. Finally, let's take a look at the derivative of some trigonometric functions. The derivative of sine of x is just cosine of x. If we place a constant in front, that constant just carries over. So the derivative of c sine of x is just c cosine of x. If we place a constant inside of the sign, 
that constant gets replicated outside when taking the derivative. So that the derivative of c sine kx becomes k c cosine kx. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. If we multiply the cosine by a constant, that constant carries over so that the derivative of c cosine x is equal to minus c sine of x. Again, if we place a constant inside of the cosine, that constant gets replicated on the outside in the derivative. So the derivative of c cosine kx is minus k c sine of kx. Thank <laughs> you. 